What follows is a very special episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast recorded during our virtual LeaderCon mental fitness event a few months ago. Today, we're talking about burnout. You've experienced it. Here's how you can overcome it, transform your work into something you enjoy more with less burnout and less struggle. And now let's get on with the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Hello again, everyone. I'm so glad that you've decided to stay with us, chosen, been intentional about staying with us. Um, uh, the person I'm going to introduce you to in just a second, well, I, I'm going to guess that one of her favorite words is awesome. It happens to be one of my favorite words, although most of you would probably associate the word remarkable with me, and I love that word as well. I love the word awesome. And this person's book is titled The Awesome Human Project. Her name is Natalie Kogan, and let me introduce you to her, and then we're going to dive in. I, before I introduce you, though, let me just say that uh, we've been trying to have this conversation for a podcast for a long time. One person had to cancel, and something else happened, and then and then uh, I said to Lisa, let's see if we can get Natalie to be in this event, and then we'll still make it a podcast. So it'll eventually be on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast as well. But let me introduce Natalie to you, and then we'll dive in. Natalie Kogan is an entrepreneur, speaker, and author on a mission to help millions of people cultivate their happier skills by making simple, scientifically backed practices a part of their daily life. She immigrated to the U.S. as a refugee from the former Soviet Union when she was 13 years old. Starting her life in the projects and on welfare, she went on to reach the highest levels of corporate success at companies like McKinsey and Microsoft. Whilst when she still found herself unfulfilled, she set out to discover what really leads to fulfilling, happier lives. Her explorations led her to create Happier, a company whose mobile app, online courses, and Happier at Work training programs have helped more than a million people improve their emotional health. And you can see then why we would want her at an event about improving our mental fitness. She is a keynote speaker and the author of this book, The Awesome Human Project. The subtitle is Break Free from Daily Burnout, Struggle Less and Thrive More in Work and Life. Do I hear an amen? Uh, she has appeared in hundreds of media outlets, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal. Uh, she's been on the Dr. Oz show, which would probably be a whole story we don't have time for. Natalie, welcome. Thank you. I am so thrilled to be here. I love the enthusiasm yours and in chat. I love everyone's enthusiasm about my hoodie. So if you're listening to this as a podcast, I just want to tell you and everyone who's here, this hoodie is the official awesome human hoodie. It is the one that I painted. It actually is the painting that is on the cover of my book, which is one of my paintings. You're looking at my art behind me. Making art is part of what makes me an awesome human. So I love the excitement. Um, and it's been so fun, Kevin. I created this hoodie for myself when the book came out and everyone's loving it. So we are gonna soon make them available to the world. But I love the excitement and the joy here. What an awesome community. Ask to that. If you were gonna turn it into being more than just one of a kind, right? Um, so, and I got all sorts of things that we can chat about. See people, so people, people want one, uh, and we're getting links in there about your art and all that sort of stuff. So, and there, people will buy one. So here's the deal team. Now that's a member of my team wanting Christmas presents. Right? <laughs> so, so Natalie, here's what I'm going to ask you to do for me. Once you have them for sale, make sure you let us know and we'll let everybody here know. And we'll make sure we put that in the show notes for the I podcast. I love that so much. You know, when I mean, out as well. when I launched the book, it's not just, I say this, it's not just the book. It's a movement to help us all embrace our humanity, our uniqueness. So one of the ways we got to remind ourselves is by things we wear. That's my, that's the purpose. Well, maybe that's one of the ways that you do this, but one of the things you talk about in the book is Talking back to our brains mm. and our, our, our last guest, uh, Beverly, we were talking a little bit about this idea of, of listening to our inner voice. You're saying we need to talk back to our brain. Talk more about that. What do you yes, mean? Yes, we do. So apologies to all the kindergarten teachers who told us to never talk back. We're going to not listen to that advice. So here is the first thing before we, why do we need to talk about to back to our brain? Why do I need to talk back to my brain? My brain is in my head. Here's the thing you need to know about your brain, your brain does not care about your happiness, about your mental fitness, about your emotional well-being. Your brain could care less about your feelings. Your brain only has one priority, and that is to keep you safe from danger, survival. It's not entirely bad news. I like being alive. I enjoy it. 
But that is the thing to understand about your brain. It is here to help us survive. And to do that, it develops some characteristics. For example, it is always looking out for possible danger, physical danger, psychological danger, and it has what's called a negativity bias. So all of our brains are much more focused on everything that is wrong or could go wrong or did go wrong because negative stimuli indicates possible danger. So understanding that is essential because it brings us to this point. The thoughts your brain gives you are not like objective observations of reality. They're given to you through all these filters the brain has developed to keep you safe. Negativity bias, fear of uncertainty, established patterns, confirmation bias. So your brain is not telling you the truth about how you feel or about your reality. So guess the good news. The good news is you are the editor of your thoughts. So our job is our practice is to hear the thought, to become aware, oh, it's coming through a filter of negativity bias. Oh, my brain is just really afraid of uncertainty. And then to talk back to your brain kindly because your brain is part of you. So we do this kindly, but firmly. I write in my book that I want you to embody like your inner grandparent. We all know what grandparents are like, right? A kid is having a tantrum. The grandparent doesn't yell at the kid. The grandparent gets on the floor and they hear you out. And then they say, all right, let's think about this. And here are the two, when you talk back to your brain, here are the two questions I want you to ask your brain. When it gives you these thoughts that cause you to struggle, that cause you to overfocus on the negative, two questions to ask your brain. First is, is this thought true? And for something to be true, you need to have facts to support it. So what you think might happen or what you think someone else thinks, those are not facts. You have to be able to defend your fact in court. So is this thought true? So just as an example, you know, Kevin. So before you go any further, before you go any further, let me just say to all of you, that means that gets rid of almost all worry immediately. If we're honest about it. Now, that's what I mean. We have to get really clear. What is a fact, right? I think this might happen is not a fact. That is a thought. So what are the facts? So just to give you an example, you know, I work with so many teams and companies and right now a lot of people are going back to the office after being at home and everyone's negativity bias is through the roof. We're all focusing on the negative stuff. Oh my God, I'm never going to have time for my family. The commute's going to be horrible. I'm going to get COVID, all those things. Okay. So we have to practice. Is that thought true? Everything is going to be horrible. I'm never going to have time for my family. Well, no. What are the facts to support it, right? And so that question, as you said, gets rid of a lot of things. We just have to be really honest about what what fact is. The second question, is this thought helpful? So if I engage in this thought, if I go along with it, if I believe it, does it help me work through this challenge? Does it motivate me? Does it fuel my energy? Does it make me a better colleague, leader, mom, person? Again, a very powerful question because the answer is rarely yes. Like, yes, thinking about all the horrible things that could happen makes me better, said no one ever. So the way that we talk to our brain as we embody that editor of our thoughts, we recognize that our thoughts are not objective reality. There's a lot of filters and mostly your brain is just speaking from fear because it wants to keep you safe. So is this thought true? Is this thought helpful? So let's, you, you brought it up. So we can't ignore it, right? Uh, We got all this future of work stuff. Now we're going back to the office. Some people are going, some people aren't. Some organizations still haven't decided what they're going to do or when they're going to do it. So do you, what are you, what are you noticing um, with clients and and, and just in your observation about are are these, are, 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 is our emotional fitness, you use the phrase emotional fitness more than uh, mental fitness. Really, we're talking about the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, do, is, is it more, I'm, I'm asking a general question. Is it more frayed now than it has been? Is it even perhaps more frayed now than it was two years ago? What's oh, your take on hundred percent. I mean, I, um, I was just giving a keynote yesterday and I think I say this in every uh, presentation now that we have to recognize we've all just been through trauma. Right. And I'm not a doctor. I do want to say I'm not a doctor. I'm not a a psychologist, but I do study a lot. And we've all been through something really traumatic and we've all or have depleted what is called our surge capacity, which is our capacity to deal with a lot of stress. We all have it. Humans are actually we're very good at dealing with stress, like stress on its own. It's not bad. 
It's when it's ongoing, which is what we've experienced. It's when it doesn't have an end. So we are all depleted. All of our energy is depleted. Our ability to handle stress is depleted. You know, I bet, and I share this with the audience, like, have you found yourself that you're snapping more? You have no patience. You get annoyed easier. It's true for all of us. It's not because you're a bad person. That buffer is gone. That extra capacity is gone because we've all gone through something so difficult. So we're all afraid. All of our um, emotional, mental, physical energy is exhausted. Our mental, emotional fitness is really afraid. And I think it's really, really important to acknowledge because, uh, you know, people talk about going back to normal. I talk about we need to get to the baseline. Like we're all below the baseline right now. This is a very like crude way to think about it, but there's like below the baseline, baseline, and above the baseline. When you're a baseline, you're doing all right. Above the baseline, you're doing awesome. We're all below the baseline. And we need to get to that place where we our brain feels safe. I mean, physically safe, psychologically safe, where we have some extra energy reserves. So yeah, I'm finding this with every kind of team or company that I work with. I think we're all in the same boat. Yeah, I'm going to come back to that below the baseline before we're done. But I, you know, one of the things that we took for granted when we were in the office, I have on the wall over here, it's a whiteboard. And, um, and a lot of people have said, if we could just get back so we could use a whiteboard again, that's a whole other conversation. But in your book, you talk about the emotional whiteboard. So what do you mean, Natalie, by the emotional whiteboard? Yeah, I, I love that we get to talk about it. So every single one of us right now, you should just look down because you're wearing an emotional whiteboard. And what I mean by that is- No, no, no. I am wearing the official Kevin blue shirt. That will be a joke to some people on the call. Uh, and you're also wearing an emotional whiteboard. And what I mean by that is all of us, our, we cannot hide how we feel. We all, as human beings, we are so good at sensing each other. It's one of the things we're best at. So how you feel right now, it's written on your emotional whiteboard except other people see it through a little bit fuzzy glasses. So you might say, you, you know, you might look at your colleague and you, you can see that she's sort of less energetic than usual or seems annoyed, but you don't know why. So you're sensing the emotional whiteboard, but you don't know exactly why. And it is uh, what I talk about in the book and what I work with so many teams and leaders on is we have to practice emotional awareness to create, to improve our mental fitness and emotional fit, we have to actually become aware. What is on my emotional whiteboard? Like, how am I feeling? We ask our colleagues, we ask our families, we ask our friends, how are you? How are you, Kevin? We have to ask ourselves. We have to recognize that we have to check in with ourselves. And then we have to be open. We have to share what's on our emotional whiteboard with our colleagues, with our teams in a way that it gives them context. So I always say this, I'm not asking you to give a TED talk about your feelings to every person you interact with, okay? That is for your best sure. friend, okay? Yeah. yeah. But what I am asking you to do is to recognize how important is it, especially in a virtual environment, but also in person to give people context. So um, I did it this morning. I had a virtual meeting with someone this morning and I'm just traveling, I'm under the weather. And I started by saying just, Listen, I just want to let you know, like I'm under the weather. I've had a tough couple of days. So if I'm sounding less energetic than normal, that's what it is. And we can save each other so much struggle, so much unnecessary wasted energy. If we just openly acknowledge like, hey, this is what's on my emotional whiteboard and it creates trust. It creates a sense of human connection. And it is so important to do right now because we've all spent a lot of time being really disconnected. Um, and it's hard to read emotions on Zoom or virtual environments. So we have to get more, we have to take responsibility for our emotional whiteboards and recognize that our emotions and energy are impacting everyone around us, whether we recognize that or not. And to actually step into a place where we are responsible and we acknowledge what's on it and we're open about it. So Amy just put in the chat, I'm just going to read it and let you respond to it. Unfortunately, yeah. there are work environments that hold that against us. So you can't really be sharing how you're feeling. Thoughts about, I'm going to comment to Amy's point. I mean, we know it's yeah. true. No, no, I'm happy to, you know, I work with all kinds of companies and I, some companies are way more open than others, but I feel very confident saying from my work to say the following, you always have an opportunity to give people context for how you're feeling. If you are in a company where talking about emotions is not something that's practiced, 
you start in smaller ways, right? So you're talking to a colleague, right? Someone you trust, someone you know, you start there. You just share context. And again, I think it's really important to articulate, like, to get really crisp about what I'm saying. I'm not telling you to come into work and nonstop talk about how you're feeling. That's not useful for anyone. I'm asking you to recognize that your energy and your feelings are impacting everyone around you already, whether you want to admit it or not. And to ask yourself, would it be helpful for my colleague or my team? Would it be helpful for them to have a little bit of context for how I'm feeling? And if the answer is yes, then you give a little bit of context. And that's why the practice that I teach is share one sentence from your emotional whiteboard. It's not a TED talk. It's not an essay. It's not venting. It's not complaining. It's not the B word. And you don't have to give all the personal details either. You can simply say, listen, I had a really rough meeting before this one. So I just want to let you know if I'm sounding a little tense, that's why. Or listen, there's some stuff going on at home that I have to deal with. So if you're sensing a little bit something for me, that's what it is. That's what I'm talking about. You're giving context because people are sensing something already and it eliminates so much of that background. Oh my God, is Natalie mad at me? Is she upset at me? What did I do? What did I do? Why is she not being so kind? Why? It eliminates all of that. So it's a, it's a responsibility and it is a gift we can give to each other. And I have confidence from having worked with every kind of company you can think of on the spectrum, you can always find an opportunity to do it. You just may need to start small and friendly. Now, you gave three examples, boom, 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 and they were all negative ones. What about sharing something from our emotional whiteboard that's positive? Man, I just came out of a great meeting. Someone after this is going to say, I was in this on this awesome event. And like, we can do that too, right? Yes. A hundred percent. And first of all, Amy, I'm so thrilled to hear that is helpful. Um, It's breaking it into smaller chunks. Uh, Yes. Sharing our joy, our enthusiasm, our excitement, our gratitude is so important. And, you know, it's, uh, I love that you brought this up because I cannot tell you how often people like in the work context ask me like, Natalie, am I going to sound like really silly with my colleagues if I'm like overly enthusiastic? There's this like weird bias or perception, you know, and by the way, I'm a Russian Jew. I come from a culture where happiness is for stupid people. So I just want to, you know, I get it. Okay. That's where I come from. And I'm a founder of a company called Happier. So, you know, we know uh, that. We know that. Yeah. So, you know, I'm just saying like, I've had to do a lot of inner work to like get there. So yes. I think it's so essential to recognize that our emotions are already out. We are already giving the signals. And so we want to, and someone just put it in chat, you want to make the covert overt because it reduces struggle. And when you share something that's truly joyful or meaningful or you're grateful for, it's literally energy fuel for other people. Literally. 100%. 100%. So... Um, I'm looking at the time and the one thing I really wanted us to get to, we haven't gotten to. So I'm stopping us and I'm taking us there because you talk about the five emotional fitness skills and then there's a whole practice around that. But I want to get people the sense to hear about the five emotional fitness skills. And for, for those of you that were with us this morning, as Natalie is unpacking this, I want you to think about what you heard this morning about the muscles and you'll hear some connection between those things. So mm. go ahead. Let's yeah, talk about the so, five. Let you lay them out. Give us a quick, give us the quick piece. And then yeah, I want to dive I'll into it. I'll give okay? you my shortest, shortest, shortest TED talk on the five skills. And just well, to we define. Yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> Let's go ahead. And just um, to define like emotional fitness, uh, because I think it's really important. So the way that I define emotional fitness is as a skill of creating a more supportive relationship with yourself, your thoughts, your emotions, and other people. So that's what emotional fitness is. So here are the five skills. The first is acceptance. And they are in order. So acceptance always comes first. It's the gateway. And acceptance is a skill of looking at how you feel and the situation ahead of you with clarity, focusing on the facts. Like, here's what's going on. Here are the facts. Here's how I feel. And that using that as your foundation to decide how to move forward. So part of acceptance is emotional awareness. A part of acceptance is editing your thoughts. And acceptance is so essential because it gets rid of all those stories that your brain has created that is causing you to struggle, that is keeping you stuck. And it gets you to a place of clarity. Like this is what the facts are. This is how I feel. 
what is the next best thing I could do? And acceptance is such a beautiful skill to take us from should to could. You know, we all get stuck in the should. The world should be like this. I should be this way. My colleagues should be like this. Acceptance takes you to could. Here's how it is. Here's how I am. Here's how the world is. What is one thing I could do to move forward? So that's acceptance. Stop second, shooting on yourself, right? Stop shooting that's on right. yourself. Stop shooting on yourself. Uh, gratitude is the second skill. And I, uh, gratitude is probably more familiar. Gratitude is a skill of focusing your attention on the small positive moments that are already in your day, even when things are challenging and being really generous and sharing your gratitude with others. And I talked about the um, negativity bias when we started. Gratitude is the most simple and powerful way to balance out your brain's negativity bias. So your brain just wants to focus on everything that's wrong. When you practice gratitude, you're literally saying, saying to your brain, dear brain, I know these things are challenging, but let's also pay attention to these things that are good and meaningful and comforting. And gratitude gives you joy, but also gratitude gives you resilience to do the hard stuff. The third skill is self-care, which I have a very different definition for than I think we think of self-care as some kind of a luxury or like a, a gift we have to give ourselves after we do all the things. Well, here's my definition of self-care. It is a skill of fueling your emotional, mental, and physical energy. That's it. We all are here are human beings. We have a limited amount of energy every day. We start with a limited amount of energy reservoir. Everything we do takes energy. So we have to do two things. We have to intentionally fuel it and we have to do fewer things that unnecessarily drain it. Multitasking, negative self-talk, mindlessly scrolling social media are two, some good ones. So acceptance, gratitude, self-care. The fourth is intentional kindness. Um, People sometimes get surprised when I talk about kindness as a skill, but I know everyone here is kind, um, but kindness is a practice. It's something that we do. I always say to people, I don't care if you're kind. What I care about, are, are you practicing kindness and compassion? So the skill of kindness is simply doing something kind to help or elevate another person and not expect anything in return. And kindness and doing small acts of kindness and just human connection is the best way that I know to fuel that sense of <clears throat> connection, to fuel our relationships, um, which is something that is so, so important right now. So acceptance, gratitude, self-care, intentional kindness. And the final skill is the bigger why. And the bigger why is the skill of connecting to your sense of purpose, your sense of meaning by looking at how do the things that I'm already doing, the work stuff, the projects, all the tasks, how do they help someone else? How do they contribute to someone? Or how do they help me reach a really meaningful longer term goal? That is where we derive our sense of purpose as human beings. And so those are the five, acceptance, gratitude, self-care, intentional kindness, and the bigger why. So uh, you, Catherine just put a comment in here about kindness is also a good way to approach self-care. So would you make a comment about the connection between those two, because we've, there's been a lot, and you obviously are coming in in the middle of this day. And a lot of these folks have been listening to other great experts as we've gone along. And, and, and you can see in there that people are making these connections, right? Which is absolutely fabulous. Awesome. And one of the things we've been talking about is that when we, we do have a limited amount of energy, of course, right? But oftentimes when we're willing to give, we get mm. back. So talk about the connection between intentional kindness, the act of being kind, and how that connects back to self-care. Can you do that for a second? Yeah, and there it's, it's actually like a circle, right? So something I say often is you can't give what you don't have. You cannot give what you don't have. And so self-care comes earlier on my list than kindness on purpose. Because um, many of us have grown up in cultures and backgrounds and um, uh kind of have learned to put ourselves last and to focus on others. And we actually can't do that. You cannot be as kind and compassionate towards others as you want if you are not kind and compassionate towards yourself. And we have to really, like we have to get courageously honest with ourselves about that truth. The way that we treat others is rooted in how we treat ourselves. So being kind towards yourself is the beginning. We have to learn how to be kind towards ourselves, which is part of self-care. But then as we fill our emotional reservoir and our mental reservoir, that is what allows us to then 
be much more compassionate towards others. It allows us to then um, bring our best to others in a true way. And there's a lot of research that shows that um, there is that connection that greater self-compassion improves your compassion, greater compassion towards others teaches you how to be more compassionate towards yourself. So there is this loop that I want you to think about. I would actually, I would actually rather than loop, I would think upward spiral, right? Yep. That we have the chance to create an upward spiral as we do one and then the other. So Mar Margie, Mar Margie asked, please repeat the definition again of emotional skills. And rather than having you do that, Natalie, I want to, uh, Margie, tell us, do you want the, do you want the, the, the five things or was there something else you were asking for? Cause the five things were listed. Someone just listed them up above in the chat. So if it's something different, let us know. And I'll make sure we ask that. Um, let us know, Margie, and we'll go back to that. Um, okay. So we got these five skills and in the book, I'm going to hold it up here. Um, that one of the things that you do is you walk us through a five week process of working on building these, mm. these things. And so we don't have time to unpack that completely, but is there something specific about sort of that practice of building them that you want to speak to? Yeah, well, I want to offer a couple of things. First is um, in the middle of May, I'm going to lead a five week group emotional fitness challenge based on the book. So if you guys are interested, just um, you can just go to nataliecogan.com and subscribe to my weekly email. I write those myself. So, you know, when we do the challenge, I'm actually going to take everyone together through it. But really one of my core principles is these are skills. And how do you build a skill? Any skill, forget about these skills. How do you build any skill? You start by practicing. That's what it is, right? If you want to become a writer, what do you do? You start writing and you write one day and the next day and the next day. And then maybe first you write short pieces, then you make them longer, right? The next exactly. thing you know. There you go. Next thing you know, you have a book. And that's one of my really core principles that I think is really important to recognize is small steps, these small practices that you do, we've talked about a bunch of them, editing your thoughts, talking back to your brain, gratitude, kindness, these small shifts, these small um, practices, these tiny steps that you take throughout the day. Again, emotional fitness is a skill of improving, uh, creating a more supportive relationship with yourself, your thoughts and emotions. So throughout the day, doing these small things to improve that relationship has huge impact right? You don't need to make dramatic life changes. You know, great resignation. Everyone's resigning from their jobs. Like that's not necessary. If you hate your job, that's okay, but you don't have to. I think we, as a culture, we look for the huge thing. And so I think a really important thing to recognize about mental fitness, emotional fitness is it's just about doing these small things on a consistent basis. There's no end. You don't like do these for X days and then you're done. This is a lifelong practice, but it's a really beautiful one because we're really fueling ourselves. And I think it's really, really important to recognize that you have a relationship with yourself and you have to nurture it just like you nurture your relationships with others. I, I just have to share, we're talking about these five emotional skills and we talked in our last session about the gratitude, the skill, the practice of gratitude. And uh, so I'm just going to share something, a small thing I'm gra grateful for right now. So over here in the chat, we have a guy in Belgium and a guy in Buenos Aires talking with each other about whether they use the word amazing or awesome. I mean, that is just, I'm sorry, but that's just awesome. Um, it's just awesome, right? That we are able to be together. And I'm, I'm grateful that we're able to, to create the space for that kind of thing to happen. And it's not even the first time that those two people have been in the that's same so great. Physical space or virtual space together. Um, so most everybody here, Natalie, is a leader. And I know that like me, you work with lots and lots of leaders. And what we've been talking about so far has largely been about what we can do as individuals. And now we have other A words like astounding, right? Um, but he here's my question. What's the lesson for us? Or what do you want to say to us when we put our leader hat on about the kinds of things we've been talking about here? Well, I want to say two things. One is you can give what you don't have and you also can't teach what you don't practice. I was that leader for 20 years. I cared about my team. I cared about their well-being, their success, and I put them first and I put myself last. I took servant leadership to me, martyr leadership. I thought that's what I was supposed to do. And you know what? Not only did it lead me to burnout, but in retrospect, I was really hurting them. I was hurting the very people that I prioritized because 
you cannot give what you don't have. You also can't teach what you don't practice. I don't care how many times you tell your team to practice gratitude, to practice self-care, to take care of themselves. If you don't make that a priority for yourself, your words are just blah, 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 noise. And so that is the most important thing I want to say to you as a leader. You know, I've given something like 70 keynotes to leaders in the past two years. I gave 300 talks during the pandemic and 70 of them were to leaders. And um, I love working with leaders, but I, I, I am on a mission to reverse this idea that servant leadership means putting other people's well-being first. It does not. You cannot bring your best as a leader if you aren't empty. You cannot bring your best if you lack compassion towards yourself. So my most important advice to leaders, actually, is to make sure that you are practicing. Be leaders ask me all the time, Natalie, how do I bring these skills to my team? How do I help my team? You, you must begin with yourself. You make your own emotional fitness a priority. You practice, you talk about how you're practicing, and then you can lead. Then you can bring these practices to your team, but you have to begin with yourself. Self-care isn't selfish. I've said that 10 times today. Uh, and, oh, well, by the way, as a leader, we are always role modeling. Yes. And they're watching our feet more than our lips. Right. Even if we're virtual, they're still watching our feet more than our lips. What we're doing matters far more than what we're saying. And so even yeah. if we're saying, hey, take care of yourself. Hey, uh, don't do email in the, at, in the evening. Hey, make sure you're taking your vacation. Are you? I mean, those are simple, obvious ones. But there's a hundred more, Natalie, that you're that you're hinting at here. And look at the chat is bubbling up here now with all this stuff. I wanted to go back. You said something earlier. I want to do this when we were talking about now that we're talking about leaders, you said that we're all below the baseline mm -hmm. and that we need to at least get ourselves back to the baseline. Yeah. Um, well, I, color that a little bit more from the leadership perspective. If we right. know as leaders that that's probably where we all are, and you just made it pretty clear that we got to make sure we get back to baseline, got that. But what else, because we're not psychotherapists and we're not right, like what else do we need to be doing other than simply be aware of that? to help our teams get back to at least the baseline. We need to acknowledge it. And this is really hard. Mo so many of our, so many leaders, including this is how I used to be before I burnt out. I thought that my job was to be cheerleader in chief, right? So no matter how I felt, I thought my job was to show up and be positive and confident and just point the way forward. And I had so much fear around sharing my own difficult emotions or even opening up opportunity for people on my team to talk about theirs because I thought, oh my God, we're going to get stuck. It's going to bring us down. The opposite is true. You know, there's a lot of research on what leaders, uh, what makes leaders most effective during crises. And we are all leading through a crisis. If any of you think you're not leading through a crisis, please readjust. We're, we are leading through a crisis. The most effective leaders through a crisis are leaders who are emotionally aware, leaders who openly share their challenges with their teams, and leaders who create opportunities for their teams to openly talk about their challenges and their feelings without descending into hopelessness. So that exercise of sharing your emotional whiteboard, sharing one sentence from your emotional whiteboard as a leader, it's a must. Everyone is looking to you. Your emotions impact others way more. That's just the reality. But create an opportunity for your team to do that. So at a weekly opportunity meeting. and space and space. So do it at a weekly meeting. Say, Hey guys, like we're going to do this thing. Now we're going to go around, we're going to check in and everyone is going to share one sentence from your emotional whiteboard. And again, that frame of a one sentence is really powerful because it just makes it like doable. You know, we're not asking for a whole thing and do that create. You have to go first. You must go first as a leader because that gives people permission. But I think that is actually a really, you know, it, it's a little bit counterintuitive that to help us get better, we have to acknowledge how we feel, but it's non-negotiable. 100%. So um, I know that this is going to be a podcast episode later. So we will, I want you to, I mean, we we're here in this place. Everyone sees all the links about all of the stuff, but Natalie, where, where do you want to point people uh, to learn more about the book and your work? NatalieKogan.com. NatalieKogan.com, except Natalie spelled with a Y. So N-A-T-A-L-Y-K-O-G-A-N.com. All the things I've talked about, we have a really great handout on there with all the five skills, all the book, my work, art, whatever you want, NatalieKogan.com. And eventually everybody, sweatshirts. Uh, and you're going <laughs> to let us know so we can take care of that. Uh, so here's uh, a question I've been asking everybody. 
today. Uh, we're talking, you know, you're, you're coming here as the, an expert telling us what we should do, what the research tells us, and things that we should we can and should be working on. Could be, not should be. Um, so what are you doing? Like, what's something that you do that helps you with your emotional or mental fitness? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a human, so I have to practice all the same things. Nothing makes me special just because that's what I teach. Even more, I have to practice. Um, one of the things that I'll just share, because um, I know our time is limited. Um, for me, my mornings are really important. Um, I Mornings are my creative time. It's when I sort of have a lot of ideas. And one of the best things I've done for my emotional fitness is one, become aware of that. And I do want to start there. It's been true my whole life, but I just had no awareness of that. So first, your first job is awareness. And the second thing is I've tried as much as I can to design my days in a way that honors my morning time. What does that mean? That means I talked to my speaking team and I said, guys, let's not schedule stuff before 11. Does that mean I never do a keynote before 11? No. I, of course, I make exceptions. I'm a real human being. I run my own business, right? But it's so powerful to recognize here's what I need and then to communicate and as much as you can to design your day to honor that. And for me, that is incredibly fueling and that honors my humanity, my energy. And so that's one of the things that I just offer that I do, but I offer just to think about what do you need? What are some things that you can design into your day that really fuel you and then have those conversations with people in your life to try and create that space. Can you do it 100%? No. Is it worth it? Yes. So I, I'll just I'll just sort of underline and highlight that uh, I am also, and my team will attest that I am a morning person, and, and and that's when I am at my best in lots and lots of ways. Uh, and so I totally hear that. But what I would say to everybody is that I think I hear often, Natalie, that a, a lot of people that do what we do, talk about being morning people, and not everyone here is a morning person. And the point I would say is find what your power time is, whatever that is. And, and it's interesting that you picked time as one of those examples, because I think it applies to all of us. But you said much more than time. So if all you heard from Natalie just there was about your calendar, she was saying a lot more than that, although- No, it's saying. really about honoring what you need. And I actually just want to like, just to make it accurate, you know, it's- um, I, I, I hate definitions like morning person, evening person, extrovert, introvert. I think we put ourselves in these boxes. My point is that part of my practice of honoring my humanity is to recognize that I need empty time in the morning to just be. Sometimes things happen, sometimes not. It's not about the morning. It's about the awareness of what I need and that it's fueling for me, right? And so don't put yourself in a box, morning person. I don't know if I'm a morning person, an evening person. I need quiet time in the morning. And recognizing that and then as much as I can designing for that is really, really powerful. Natalie Kogan, it has been my pleasure. It's been my honor to have you here. Everybody in the chat, claps, thank yous, whatever. Uh, and um it's we've been working at getting this to happen. I'm so glad we made it happen. We did. And, we uh, did. It's a joy to be here with all of you. Thank you for such an awesome discussion. Thank you all of you for your enthusiasm. How fun. And I hope to let's stay connected in all the ways, including hoodies, hoodies. I know I got to work on it. I know the hoodies. Uh, I, exactly. Uh, listen, everybody, I'm going to do you all know the drill at this point. I'm going to end this session. Go meet our next guest. And you see all the love for you over there, Natalie. Natalie, thank, thank you, you so I'm much really for being grateful. here. What a great audience. I love it. Thank Such you all so much. Such a pleasure, everybody. Thank all you. the best.